Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. No matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. This podcast is brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. The Dealer Connect CRMI app with integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work. Moving higher in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving higher time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving higher. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. I've got Alan Hoskins back on here and he is the I don't know why I struggle with this every time you come on here, Alan. You know, I I even have it written down and I can't even read it right. You know? President, National Sales Director. How's it's not that, that hard either, it, Casey. It's not like you're in French or something like that. I don't know why I struggle with it every time you come on here. But Alan is with American Farm Mortgage, and I appreciate you coming on, man. How you doing, bud? I'm doing well, Casey. Thanks for having me back again. I appreciate uh, it. I love having you on, man. Uh, the cool thing about when you come on, we have a podcast before the podcast, and one of these days we'll record. I was going to secretly start recording that way. That way we catch it all. But uh, we had some good, we had some good conversation to start with. A lot of crazy things happen right now. If you look at what's going on, um, and I mean crazy in the fact of of how the market has reacted to what the Fed did. You know, we had that Fed meeting here earlier this year. Federal Reserve comes out and says we're going to pump the brakes kind of watch what happens here we're not going to raise rates in november we do have the december meeting coming up here and all they said was we're not raising rates Mm -hmm. didn't say anything else didn't say hey we're gonna we're gonna lower rates or this is the last time we're raising rates never didn't Mm -hmm. say anything Mm -hmm. you would have thought the market had some kind of secret memo somewhere that said hey we're not only we're going to stop raising rates we're also going to drop rates in january Mm -hmm. february or march time frame um which I, I wish I had that memo because I can make a lot of money right now, but I, but I didn't get that memo. So I guess mm-hmm. Alan, as you're looking at what's going on right now um, in, in the world of interest rates, CPI stuff came back, you know, a lot cooler than what they thought it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've seen some PPI reports that are coming out that are a lot, uh, a lot different than what people thought. So th- it is, it's working, it is working, but mm-hmm. the fed, um, they said they're getting to 2% and they're going to get to 2% come hell or hot water, I guess. So, as you look at this, Alan, what are your thoughts there? What are some of your reactions to what you see happening from the November Fed uh, report? Well, Casey, you're absolutely right in everything you said. And I think it's worth remembering this is the same Fed that was a little bit late to the party in raising rates. Yep. And did that result in perhaps some increases that otherwise might not have been? Obviously, there is no such thing as what might have been. Right. We, we deal with what is. Yeah. I think that 
with any producer or any business person in general. I think you look at where interest rates are and you try to position yourself as best you can with the knowledge that exists today. And I'm, you know, Casey, I'm not a gambler. Despite the fact that I farm, I'm not a gambler. I would much rather position myself to where I have some level of protection if there is an additional increase in rates, but give myself the option to have the benefit if we do see rates start to decrease. And I think that way you're managing your operation as best you can with what is always going to be an unknown. Interest rates just, I don't think it's ever wise to quote unquote bet the farm, if you will, on where interest rates are going to go. I think you just manage, manage with the understanding that if rates go higher, you have some protection, but if rates go lower, you have an opportunity to pick up some value there as well. Yep. Would you, I guess, as you take a look at what's going on right now, so, you know, we're taking a look at um, these kind of situations that we're in right now, moving through 23. 23 looks like it's going to finish strong. We know we've got all that. There's nothing out there showing that 23 is some catastrophic failure is going to, you know, creep up on us here in the last 60 days of the year. But Mm -hmm. as you're looking at out in the 24, there are some concerns out there where people are looking at, you know, this could be a year where we see some some massive crops and, you know, mm-hmm. El Nino year and those kind of things, which could, you know, put some strain on what's out there. See the mm-hmm. stuff that's happened in Brazil with mm-hmm. uh, some wildly uh, uncommon drought issues. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we've talked about it on here quite a bit. You're at a conference with, uh, with Sean Hackett and mm-hmm. when you was the speaker at it. And mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure you heard all about those stuff in Brazil and his, his, uh, take on that which guys if you listen to this podcast you've heard that before mm-hmm. um but as you're looking at those kind of things happen there's just those there's just i think from my opinion looking out at 24 that there's more uncertainty going into 24 than any other year that i've that i've been putting this podcast on and, and, we're, and we're talking going through 16 17 18 19 you know those those years where there was mm-hmm. some uncertainty about what was going but it just feels like there is there are things pointing to where, hey, you know what? This could be a really great year for the United States agricultural marketplace. Mm-hmm. But there's just as many things pointing to this could be one of the more stringent years uh, mm-hmm. for that thing. So I guess as you look at that, Alan, what are your thoughts? Well, you talked about Sean and some of his presentations. I think, number one, he brings up a lot of, a lot of things, Casey, that are very valid and certainly worth listening to. I think any time that you go into a period of larger than normal uncertainty, whatever that looks like, it makes it even more important to fine tune numbers and look at how you manage margins, kind of like we were talking about the interest rates a moment ago. Looking at how do I as best as I can with the information I have and the tools that I have to work with, how do I look at managing both sides of my profit and loss statement? How do I make the input purchases and manage the expense side to minimize it as much as possible without cutting completely to the bone? I don't think that ever serves anyone well. And also looking at the tools that are going to be available to me, because we don't know what weather is going to look like. You talked about some of the issues going on down in Brazil right now with some of the weather items that are affecting them. Uh, we know that we have some historically low river levels here in the yeah. U.S. If you look at the southern, southern southern part of the Mississippi, we know that at least in our area right now, we're going into this fall, or we've gotten into this fall, we're going into this winter, that it's pretty darn dry around here. and We've not had any measurable precipitation in a yeah. while. We don't know what the winter is going to look like. but. I think just making sure that folks look at some profit opportunities that may present themselves, but also working with their advisors, working with their merchandisers, their green marketing folks to help understand how do I best take advantage of some opportunities that could arise next summer, both on old crop and new crop. Because I think anytime you start looking at locking in inputs, it makes sense 
to make sure that you're locking in some margin, profit margin there as well. So obviously that's going to pertain to the new crop, but there's still an awful lot of old crop out here. And that would appear that there may be some old crop out here for a good while, Casey. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of things pointing in that direction when you, um, so, so here's, here's when I called you, I actually called you about this one and this mm-hmm. was some ideas I was bouncing around in my head, uh, working mm-hmm. with a guy. Variable rate interest. So if you look at the bond markets and guys that deal with bonds right now, they're locking in these rates they see now because they're, they're anticipating dropping interest rates, which then would, you know, would affect the return on their, mm-hmm. on their, uh, on their bonds and those kind of things. And if you look at it from a reverse standpoint, mm-hmm. that means that interest rates, uh, on on borrowed money is going to go the opposite direction as well. So right now mm-hmm. you're looking at between seven and a half and eight percent, depending on what you're who you're dealing with and what you got going on. Uh, mm-hmm. Equipment loans, short term equipment loans. And I'm not talking long term, thirty year mortgage or anything like that. I'm just talking mm-hmm. that three to five year five year period. If the Fed does decide, hey, you know, we're going to start leveling off here a little bit and start maybe tapering just a little bit into mm-hmm. twenty four and twenty five and, and cranking that back. You start looking at some of the stuff, the variable rate approach to uh, borrowing may have some mm-hmm. uh, up, up, you know, backside um, upside potential. If you are, if you look at it, you know, you sign a note at seven and a half percent, and then three years from now you're you're paying five and a half percent interest. You know, that, that's a pretty mm-hmm. good, pretty good deal. Mm-hmm. As you look at those, Alan, and you're having those discussions with folks. What what's your philosophy on short term variable rate interest loans and those kind of things? Sure, I think Casey. Number one, you look at the spread. You know, what's the spread between a variable rate versus a fixed rate, and what amount of risk? If I'm a borrower, what's my comfort level in risk? There are borrowers out there, Casey. You and I both know that they want to know what the worst thing is that can happen. Those are the folks that are still going to be comfortable with that fixed interest rate because if rates do tick a little bit higher, they still sleep well. If rates do trend down, candidly, a borrower with a good, strong financial statement and more importantly, a good, strong cash flow because ultimately that's what repays the loan. Folks with strength in both those areas will have some opportunity somewhere down the road if they feel the need or see the value to refinance some of that fixed debt, if rates do drop, they're going to have the opportunity to do that. So that's another arrow they have in their quiver to where they can get the comfort level they have today by going ahead and locking in that rate, but knowing that maybe a year or two down the road, if rates do drop significantly, then they can look at refinancing that debt. Now, if rates drop a half a point, candidly, the juice may or may not be worth the squeeze in that right. particular instance to redo that. Yeah. yeah. So I think as every borrower is an individual, each one of them, they have different trigger points that are important to them. And I think that's where they discuss the options with whoever it is they're working with about what happens if the rates drop. And I don't, and I do go fixed rate. What are my options? Same way with the folks that are a little more comfortable on the variable side. The only difference between them and the folks that like the fixed interest rates, those folks know they're going to get a benefit if the rates go down automatically, but they may pay a little premium to do that if rates did tick up a little bit more. So it goes back to the comfort level of the individual, I think, Casey, as much as anything. And understanding before you sign the loan documents, regardless of fixed or variable, make sure you understand, A, are there prepayment premiums, or excuse me, prepayment penalties, so that if you lock in a rate, if you want to refinance it, is there going to be a penalty? Make certain you ask that question if you're locking in a fixed interest rate. On the variable side, are there any caps on this? How frequently does it reprice? Annual repricing is a whole lot different. If you look back over the past 12 months, if you'd had a loan that was annually repriceable, depending upon when you signed that document, you would have been cushioned against some of those rates. 
So understand the repricing frequency and the prepayment penalties, I think, are the two key things in today's environment where you really want to understand your document before you put your signature on. Yeah. So that kind of brings up the next one, too, is as you look what's going on with interest rates and say stuff does start to decline. Mm-hmm. What's, what are your thoughts on on how leasing fits into that structure? If we go back down to a, you know, a quote unquote lower interest rate environment. Well, I think it depends on the tax needs, or excuse okay. me, what would benefit the ta- person the most from a tax perspective? Because if what they need is a more of an immediate tax benefit, but also some ongoing tax benefit that leasing may be a a little better fit for them because it's going to allow, depending upon how the lease is structured, it's going to allow them to have a pretty straight line deduction over the, not a pretty, they will have a straight line deduction over the term of that lease. Whereas, you know, as well as I do, when you buy, if you're using the section 179, you're getting it today but you're sacrificing in the future from that. Now, that's right. the tax side of it. The cash flow side, honestly, again, goes back to the type of lease it is. What kind of buyout is it going to have at the end? So I think it makes sense to look at both of those things because I don't like to see people make financial decisions solely based upon tax consequences because that can end up affecting them from a cash flow perspective a lot worse than they may have imagined. And you sure don't want to find that out after the fact. Yeah, no, that's, that is a good, that is a very good point because sometimes I find myself doing that. If I do this, then I do that, you know, and so there's, Uh Some some short term gain for long term consequence, I guess. Sometimes in a lot of those decisions. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, as you take a look at <clears throat> some of the stuff that you see when it comes to, I man, I know we got a long ways to go before we get into crop insurance and those kind of things for next year and, and those kind of things. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of talk of of, of drought and those kind of mm-hmm. out my especially out my neck of the woods this coming year. It's supposed to be a little bit wetter, kind of your neck of the woods, so there won't there, those kind of situations are going to pop in there. But as you look at historically, kind of as you look at from a lending a lender's perspective, mm-hmm. and again, you, there's a long long time before they start setting these rates for for what that looks like. But do you, what kind of planning do you anticipate to see some of your customers go through when they start looking at? Hey, I'm going to assume a few things here, but I'm going to look at some of these variable um, or these varying um, instances that may have come up and, and how these, if if things kind of stayed the same, how's that going to change my, my crop insurance needs or, or not, or how those, am I protected in that comparatively? I guess, what are your thoughts there as you look at some of that stuff long term? Well, first and foremost, Casey, you're bringing up a point that is all too infrequently thought of at this time of year. And I commend you for asking this question because it is something that does need to be factored in, I think, even at this time of year. I would really urge people to be sitting down with their crop insurance agents right now, looking at the tools that are out there, because candidly, there's some products available today that weren't available even two or three years ago. You're absolutely right in what you said about some of the discussion you hear is about some potential drought in different areas. I think you, most of the folks in the Midwest remember 2012 all too well. And we certainly, while that turned out to be a pretty darn profitable year for a lot of folks, it was strictly due to crop insurance agents or excuse me, crop insurance. And Casey, I know of a couple of cases in particular where some guys made some crop insurance decisions going into that year that they missed out on a seven-figure check simply because they changed what they had done historically. Now, again, 
I'm not advocating do what you always do. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is understand what products are out there. There's some higher coverage levels available. And Casey, I know that there's still a few people out there. I think it's a lot less than it used to be, but there's still a mindset out there among a few people that crop insurance is not a good thing because I don't get my money back. I don't think they have the same thought when they buy insurance on their combine or their house. Right. The last thing they want is to get their money back. Right. When they buy insurance on their combine, their plan or their house. Yep. And Casey, I think there's a lot of people that work in town at nine to five jobs that if they had the opportunity to buy a year's worth of income, no matter what happened to their job, they'd be pretty interested in that. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's really what crop insurance is doing because I don't know how many other people there are other than farmers that have the kind of risk that they have in things that are beyond their control. And crop insurance is that tool that helps keep them in the game sometimes, or even in guys in cases where there are guys that have no debt and have a pretty strong financial condition. Do you really want to jeopardize one full year's income? That's something that I think producers need to, Bear in mind that ultimately, whatever they want to do, that's up to them. You know, as a banker, I don't want to ever tell someone, and I will never tell someone what they have to do. But I just want them to think about things like that when they're making their decision. But candidly, have those discussions, start them now with their crop insurance agents so that as they get into that February, March time frame, they've got a better handle. And we're going to know more things then than we know now about what yeah. we're going into yeah. the year looking at. So be prepared for that. No. All right. <clears throat> All right. So this is one thing you brought up that I think is something I never even would have considered that this would be an issue because you figured this time of the year would be when these kind of meetings would be taking place leading up to, you know, renewal season and, you know, what's your tax situation look like and all those kind of things would be coming up. But uh but being very proactive in trying to set appointments with your lenders so you can understand what their thought process is. So they can understand your thought process going mm-hmm. into this, this, you know, like we talked about, you know, 23 and 24, there's a lot of, a mm-hmm. lot of uncertainty there and just kind of laying that out there for everyone to, to start. So that makes sure everyone's on the same page that when you, when you get to January, February, March time frame, you're not surprised mm-hmm. by some stuff. So I guess talk a little bit about your mindset there, Alan. Sure. Casey, I kind of view it as this time of year in particular, it's a really good opportunity for the lender to earn their place at the table. We're coming out of the crop year to where we have a good idea where inventories are going to be. We can start putting together some projections going into 24 based upon where what we know now. And we also have the opportunity to hear what producers may have learned in talking to their accountants. Hopefully they've already started that process. And if there's going to be any needs for cash utilization as they go into year end for making any trades and will that cash utilization be from additional leverage or will it be from cash that they have on hand? I think it's a great opportunity for the farmer to get some value out of that banking relationship from the standpoint of hearing the lender's perspective about what they see the positives being in the per, in the producer's numbers, where the opportunities for improvement may lie, and give them some things to consider. Again, not the lender dictating. That's not the way it works. But the lender giving them some thoughts and ideas that perhaps they hadn't thought of, or the lender giving them some solidification of the idea they believe about where they are and how they're progressing. And I think those kind of conversations now make for even deeper conversations as you get into the renewal season 
for the lines of credit because you've already laid the base. Everybody kind of understands a little bit about where the numbers should be this year, what tax planning is going to occur, and makes the conversation as you go into that February, March time frame a little more productive overall for the farmer because it's not as fresh, if you will, about where the numbers are, that there's already been the base laid so that everybody kind of has an idea of what to expect. Yep. So, so I just thought of this. This is a question I'm surprised I haven't asked you yet for uh, as many times yep. as you and I have, have had this conversation been doing this podcast here. Um, we are at that time of year, post-harvest is just around the mm-hmm. corner. I mean, for the most, most part, a lot of guys are already done. They're going through that mindset of, <clears throat> as they look at their tax situation, are we going to buy a new one? Mm-hmm. Are we going to run ours through the winter service program mm-hmm. and fix fix what needs to be fixed? Mm-hmm. When you are looking at equipment right now, mm-hmm. and I mean, I, I have my philosophy on this, but mm-hmm. as you look at it from a lender's perspective, when have you fixed it enough and you need to buy a new one? And when when do you need to run it through one more winter service program before you decide to, to uh, go get a new one? You know, Casey, that... That's a really great, pardon me, really great question. In fact, I've had this conversation with two producers within the last week. And okay. ironically enough, it relates to combines. It's a shocker. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think the answer is dependent upon, A, what do their finances look like? Sure. B, what do their mechanical abilities look like with regard to their comfort level in making a few more repairs? Mm -hmm. C, what is the repair history on that machine, particularly if it's a combine? Right. If it's something that you've put a significant, and significant varies depending upon what operation you're looking at. But if it's, if you put a significant amount of money in that and you're comfortable with the basic machine itself and there's not a true need or you're not picking up some technology that you don't have presently to help you better understand where some more profit opportunities may lie, then I would say you really do kind of consider, would I be better off running it another year? You know, we, we've seen a little bit of change, Casey, you and I have talked about this. We've seen a little bit of change in the used equipment market, particularly on combines, if you will. Yeah, a little bit. Here, here within the past 60 to 90 days, you're starting to see potentially a few more units coming into the market. We know typically what that does, supply and demand to the cost of things. Do I know what it's going to look like a year from now? Absolutely not. I certainly do not. But I think that if they've got a machine that's been problematic, they know there's a significant amount of dollars that are going to need to be spent on it. They're in a pretty good cash position, and they have the opportunity to pick up a machine that will also make them a little bit of money, maybe from the technological change over what they have now. I think that's a really strong case for looking at trading. Now, one thing I do tell people to kind of think a little bit about if you're going to trade and if you're going to a bigger machine, make certain that the money spent on that bigger machine is not going to create a bottleneck for you in another portion of your operation. If you're going from an eight row corn head to a 12, what's that going to do to you from a grain cart perspective? What's that going to do to you from the need for another truck perspective? Consider those type of things as part of the purchase. Yeah, my my philosophy on that is, you know, I, I look at it from what you've done to it, where it's at. Um, if you've done, if you have a five hundred hour combine, and you've you spent that that five hundred hour you know service and the few things that you need to do to it and those kind of things, that's that's one thing. I think when you get to that seven hundred and fifty hour range, that's when you start seeing that first real big, you know, mm-hmm. shop bill come through. And yep, I, I think when I'm looking at it, if, if yeah. you if you're at like to, to your point, to your point is if you are at um, if you are at 
the 500 hour mark and you can, you can do something. Mm-hmm. I think that's the best time for you to move on a combine, right? If you spent mm-hmm. the seven, you got the 750 and you, and you're, you've gone past 500 and you're looking mm-hmm. at that seven, that's staring in your face. You need to do the repairs mm-hmm. and run it one more year mm-hmm. and take a look at it and then start looking at that because, because you, the, the repairs don't add value to the machine. They just get it back to where it should have been to start with. And I think that's mm-hmm. the kind of the, the, the the Achilles heel with some of these deals when you've traded through them, you've done mm-hmm. those those mm-hmm. repairs already. Now you need to go get the good out of those repairs. You know, mm-hmm. you need to get that that fifty percent of those parts back out or whatever it is that you're going to go do. That's why I think if you're looking at five hundred hours, is the best time to trade a combine. If you mm-hmm. zero to five hundred hours, best time to trade a combine. If not, mm-hmm. it's you're probably you know. 750 to a thousand is probably the next best place to train to trade a combine. Mm-hmm. And I think that just depends. But again, it goes back to your point of some, some of these operations, you know, you can look at it where you put, you buy a combine with 750 hours on it. It might be three seasons before you get to a thousand. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Those are the kind of things that you take into consideration as well. If you're two or three mm-hmm. or 400 hours a year on a combine, mm-hmm. more than likely that's when you need to start looking at those hour ranges. But, you also you take in consideration what your hours of use are too. If it's you know hundred hours a year, that's a different. It's a whole different mindset than if it's three or four hundred hours a year. So exactly, I, I would agree with everything you said completely. <clears throat> yeah. So maybe the the sole exception, Casey, that I could see to that, if somebody's gone in and done a lot of work on a combine and they've got a neighbor that's looking for a combine like they have, maybe. Oh yeah. But that is the exception. <laughs> yep. But no, other than that, I I agree with you completely. Yeah. I think you're spot on. And also, too, it has crop. Crop you're harvesting, too, has all, plays a big. If you're harvesting wheat versus edible beans, that's two completely different things, you know. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Edible beans are like beans. small rocks running through your machine, oh, so you got <laughs> you to you pay attention to that. Your wear is significantly yeah. different than it is on wheat, you know what I mean? So, all mm-hmm. good stuff. Well, I think that's probably a good place to stop. Any final thoughts you want to throw out there before we close things down here? Now, Casey, uh, certainly wish uh, everyone a happy Thanksgiving. We're taping this. We're in the week of Thanksgiving, and yeah. wish everyone out there a happy Thanksgiving. And Casey, appreciate the opportunity to be on the show with you, and thank you for this. Thank you for this chance. Oh man, uh, pleasure's all mine. And uh, you know, like I tell everybody, uh, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday because it's absolutely no pressure. Mm-hmm. You just have to, not, you know, you have to eat too much and you have to watch football. I mean, <laughs> what what more could you possibly ask for in a holiday? You know what I mean? So, well, said. it's a place where you can have, you can eat four pieces of pie and nobody cares. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's totally fine. So, yes, that's good stuff. Absolutely. Well, happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. And we will talk to you again next month, man. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate it. Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. I got Snapchat now. I go to Moving Iron Podcast on Snapchat. I've got TikTok. You can check me out there, Moving Iron Podcast. And you can go to the YouTube channel, which is Moving Iron Podcast. And I got them all, Alan. I'm just, I don't even know how to use half of them, but I got them all. You know what I mean? So <laughs> check those out there. Go to Moving Iron LLC.com for everything Moving Iron related. And uh, Moving Iron Summit's coming up here a year from now uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, September 4th through the 6th. Alan's going to be there talking about what's going on, so looking forward to that as well. So, Alan, you uh, have a good one. We'll uh, talk to you again later, man. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Alan Hoskins. Let's move some iron, folks. Out. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. 
With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. No matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. This podcast is brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. The Dealer Connect CRMI app with integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work. Moving higher in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving higher time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving higher.